You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hi there. Sam Meisenberg from N2K here, inviting you to join me for a brand new monthly segment that you can find right here in the Cyberwire Daily called Learning Layer. Cybersecurity is a constantly changing field, and you need to evolve with it. That means you'll need to acquire new skills and new knowledge. Join me as we learn how to learn in the cybersecurity space. On Learning Layer, we'll be chatting about everything from how to improve technical skills to certification exam prep to brain science. Happy learning. I'll see you in the layer. Are you frustrated with cyber risk scores backed by mysterious data, zero context, and cloudy reasoning? Typical cyber ratings are ineffective, and the true risk story is begging to be told. It's time to cut the BS. Black Kite believes in seeing the full picture with more than a score, one where companies have complete clarity in their third-party cyber risk using reliable, quantitative data. Make better decisions. Reduce your uncertainty. Trust Black Kite. The DPRK's Kim Suki attempts to hit joint military exercises. Australian domain administrator Auda may have been breached. Wolf Locker's version of a tech support scam. The U.S. intelligence community warns of cyber threats to space systems. Rick Howard looks at forecasting cyber risk. Deepin Desai from Zscaler shares ransomware trends. And more wartime disinformation out of Russia. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Intel briefing for Monday, August 21st, 2023. South Korea's Gyeonggi Nambu Provincial Police Agency said yesterday that the North Korean threat actor Kim Suki targeted South Korean contractors working for a joint military exercise between the U.S. and South Korea, Security Week reports. The agency found that an IP address used in the attack was also used in an alleged Kim Suki hack against a South Korean nuclear reactor operator in 2014. The threat actor used spear phishing attacks in an attempt to steal information. The police agency stated that military-related information was not stolen. The No Escape ransomware gang claims to have breached Australia's .au domain administrator, Auda, the record reports. The gang says it's stolen 15 gigabytes of data, including personal information. On Sunday, Auda announced that the cybercriminal had presented proof of possessing a limited set of data. This data compromises screenshots displaying a list of files. The investigation is still in progress, aiming to authenticate the assertions made by the cybercriminal and confirm the origin of the data. Updates will be given as more information becomes accessible. Meanwhile, it's advised for everyone to stay cautious of possible malicious online actions like phishing endeavors and fraudulent schemes where individuals or groups may ask for or exploit your personal information. The nonprofit said that it's notified the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, the Department of Home Affairs, and the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner of the potential breach. Malwarebytes has published an update on WoofLocker. This is a complex traffic redirection scheme used for tech support scams, and Malwarebytes has been tracking it for some time. The company says that attribution in this case is murky. The researchers wrote... While we still do not know a lot about who is behind this scheme, we believe it may be the work of different threat actors that specialize in their area of expertise. WoofLocker may very well be a professional toolkit 
built specifically for advanced web traffic filtering and used exclusively by one customer. Victims that fall for the scam and call the phone number are then redirected to call centers, presumably in South Asian countries. WoofLocker is distributed via compromised websites, most of which are of an adult nature. The researchers note that WoofLocker's infrastructure is now more robust than before to defeat potential takedown attempts. The FBI, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations have issued a bulletin outlining cyber espionage threats targeting the space industry, Reuters reports. The bulletin states, Foreign intelligence entities recognize the importance of the commercial space industry to the U.S. economy and national security, including the growing dependence of critical infrastructure on space-based assets. They see U.S. space-related innovation and assets as potential threats, as well as valuable opportunities to acquire vital technologies and expertise. Foreign intelligence entities use cyber attacks, strategic investment, including joint ventures and acquisitions, the targeting of key supply chain nodes, and other techniques to gain access to the U.S. space industry. The warning is heavy on the threat to intellectual property, but it also warns against direct threats to space systems themselves. The New York Times points out that China and Russia represent the serious adversaries in this field, and that the U.S. intelligence community thinks it likely that any future war will open with a cyber attack against satellite systems. Russia's invasion of Ukraine provides the template. The warning about space systems arrived without a lot of explicit discussion of Russia's successful, albeit short-lived, cyber attack against Viasat modems in the opening hours of its invasion. That disruption, which Ukraine was able to overcome in a matter of about a week, still represents one of the few tactically significant cyber actions of Russia's war against Ukraine. It hasn't really been repeated, with most cyber action declining into hacktivist demonstrations and conventional cyber espionage. So, the cyber front in Russia's war has been quiet of late, with few cyber attacks or significant instances of cyber espionage reported over the past several days. But disinformation continues. Recent themes in Russian influence operations have sought to portray Poland as avid to recover territories the Soviet Union annexed to the Ukrainian Republic at the end of the Second World War. The overarching theme of Russian influence operations, represented in a very long interview task conducted with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, is that Russia is the victim of aggression, with Ukraine's government serving as a cat's paw for the United States which seeks Russia's reduction to a permanent state as an impoverished minor power. The theme is repeated by Iran's semi-official Mare News Agency. There's also some retail disinformation in progress. Ukraine Forum reports that Russian bot operators are sending residents of Kherson threatening texts over social media warning them of physical harm. The recipients are told they'll be spared if they report on the Nazis to the Russians, that is, if they reveal information about Ukrainian forces. What effect, if any, the threats will have remains unclear. Time will tell. Coming up after the break, Rick Howard looks at forecasting cyber risk. Deepin Desai from Zscaler shares ransomware trends. Stay with us. Tired of cybersecurity mega conferences? MWISE is different. With a focused agenda and targeted problem solving, MWISE is where security's best go to get better. From September 18th through the 20th in Washington, D.C., you'll join a special community of security's sharpest minds, hear perspectives you might not get anywhere else, and reach a new level of mastery that'll prepare you for what's next. Register early and save at mwise.mandiant.com slash conf23. That's mwise.mandiant.com forward slash conf23.
And now, a word from our sponsor, Sintiat. As an 8A hub zone minority and woman owned small business company, Sintiat specializes not only in software engineering, but in artificial intelligence and cybersecurity as well. Sintiat's customers, and they retain those customers, include the U.S. Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and the Departments of State and Justice. Their mission is to protect the systems that protect the people who protect us. If you're looking for a partner in accomplishing your mission, check out Sintiot.com. That's C I N T E O T.com. Your partners in everything data and cybersecurity. And it's always my pleasure to welcome back to the show Rick Howard. He is the CyberWire's chief security officer and also our chief analyst. Rick, welcome back. Hey, Dave. So on this week's CSO Perspectives podcast, you are providing an update on the current state of risk forecasting. What do you have in store for us? Well, Dave, you know, fans of the show know that I've been going on and on over the last three years about finding a practical way to forecast risk for the business. And I want to emphasize the word practical here because, you know, I've read all the best books on the subject. You know, there's Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction by Tetlock and Gardner, which I highly recommend. Hmm. Uh, There's How to Measure Anything in Cyber Risk by Hubbard and Syerson. And Measuring and Managing Information Risk, a fair approach. One of the originals is probably the original book back in the day by Freund and Jones. All Cybersecurity Canon Hall of Fame inductees, by the way. And I've interviewed most of the authors, either for the Canon Project or for the CyberWire, and some of them are friends of mine. Cyrus and I even presented together on the subject at the RSA conference a few years back, and Jack Freund reviewed the chapter on risk in my book, Cybersecurity First Principles. So up to now, I felt like we were all just a bunch of rebels shouting into the wind and not getting much traction, like we were a bunch of crazies. You know, you know those people, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's beginning to, to change. How come? I mean, has there been some event you can point to, any kind of turning point that represents this change in mindset? Well, admittedly, my indicator is maybe anecdotal, but uh, I'm starting to see security vendors incorporate some of these ideas into their products to make it easier for people like us to incorporate them into their InfoSec programs. So for this show, I talked to two security vendor founders and discussed why these things, these changes are happening now and what's driving the change. All right. We'll look forward to that. It's CSO Perspectives. It is part of CyberWire Pro. You can find out all about that on our website, thecyberwire.com. Rick Howard, thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. And it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show Deepin Desai. He is the global CISO and head of security research and operations at Zscaler. Uh, Deepin, always great to have you back on the show. Uh, I want to touch today on the ransomware report that you and your colleagues have recently published. This is your 2023 ransomware report. Bring us up to date here. What, what did you all find? Hey, thank you, Dave. So yeah, ransomware report, this is our annual Threat Labs report that we published uh, based on the findings from the year 2022, and it does cover some of the trends that we're seeing uh, in 2023 as well. What the team does behind the scene is look at ransomware attacks that were observed across the globe. This is where we take into account the telemetry that Zscaler, Zero Trust Exchange, our product provides, as well as the tracking effort that the team does uh, globally where we're tracking various threat actor groups and their infrastructure. So some of the key findings from the report, um, number one, ransomware impact uh, actually was fairly high uh, in terms of region on United States. In fact, the number that we saw was nearly half of the ransomware campaigns over the last 12 months were targeting U.S. uh, organizations in the United States. In terms of industry vertical, we saw arts, entertainment, recreation industries uh, experiencing uh, the biggest surge um, year over year. When you compare it to 2021, uh, in 2023, uh, 
these uh, industries saw almost a 400% increase in the number of attacks. Manufacturing sector remained the most targeted industry vertical. This is consistent with the annual report that we published a year before. Uh, It's actually accounting for almost 15% of the total ransomware attacks that we tracked. And it's uh, followed by uh, services sector, which uh, experienced almost 12% of the total ransomware attacks last year. Hmm. And then the final insight that I'll call out is uh, in terms of there are more and more ransomware families that, that keep coming up. There were 25 new families that the team discovered. And these were all ransomware families that were using uh, double extortion or a new phenomena that we will discuss more uh, that we're calling encryption-less extortion attacks this year. Hmm. Well, let's dig into that. I mean, when we say encryptionless, uh, I mean, it, it sounds self-evident, but can you describe that for us? Yeah, so what we're seeing, and I, I have my reasons to believe why these threat operators are going that route, but what we're starting to see is more and more of these prolific ransomware gangs, and I can name a few like uh, Dark Angels, uh, more recently we've seen Klopp ransomware gang as well. Like what, what they're starting to do is they will not encrypt the files. They will not cause business disruption to these uh, victim organization. Uh, and the goal over there is they're potentially trying to stay under the radar, both from their perspective as well as the organization that is being targeted. Instead, they will exfiltrate large volume of data, like lots and lots of data. And that's where they are holding the the organization hostage. Right? The data is held hostage. Uh, if ransom is not paid, yes, they will make it public and they will make it known to everyone that this organization fell for a ransomware attack. But if the ransom is paid out, in many of the cases, the information does not become public. Is the notion here that that perhaps they're trying to avoid the organizations getting in touch with law enforcement? I would say it's, it's multiple things, yes. Number one is they are trying to stay under the radar from law enforcement crackdowns. Right, So the the less they are in the news, uh, the better it is for them. Uh, number two is, yes, it, it's it's also a signal to the organization, right, to not involve, um, you know, law enforcement in, in some of these uh, attacks where the whole negotiation piece and the ransom payment piece ha- happens under the radar. Having said that, I mean, one of the discussion I was having with a large CISO was, you need to disclose these attacks. That's the right thing to do. You have to. And you need to do that if you were to claim your insurance, your cyber insurance uh, for, for these type of attacks. So there are pros and cons. I mean, every organization has their approach in how they would do it. I would absolutely be in the favor of doing the proper disclosure, going the right route. Law enforcement and other stuff may or may not happen in each of these attacks. Yeah. What are we seeing in terms of the trends? Is, is there any sense that organizations are, are doing a better job of defending themselves or where do we stand? Yeah, so there, there is definitely progress in terms of where the organization's security posture is uh, when it comes to, say, five years ago, especially after the pandemic. Uh, we have seen fast tracking of the digital transformation and I'm going to use the term zero trust, uh, but, but I know that term has been heavily used and abused. Uh, mm. The true <laughs> zero trust is where you know, you're actually implementing fundamental zero trust principles like always verify, assume breach, you know, and uh, never trust. Right? So this is where you're not bringing the users on the same network as applications, proper segmentation, identity-based verification. Point I'm trying to make is yes, organizations, almost all organizations have embarked on the path to that zero trust transformation journey, but the maturity level is different across the board. There's also certain areas that are further along. Uh, when I when I say certain areas, certain industry verticals are further along than the others because of uh, regulations and other stuff. These attackers are very very opportunistic. 
right? They're, they're, wherever they see an opportunity, whether it's um, a vulnerable host, whether it's a pre-existing infection inside the environment, any organization where they're still having a f- relatively flat network, leveraging things like VPN, it, it's a juicy attack surface for these guys. So it, it makes their life easier to move laterally in those environments, steal large volume of data without being noticed, and then um, you know demand these ransoms. All right. Well, it's the 2023 ransomware report from Zscaler. Deepin Desai is the global CISO there. Deepin, thank you so much for joining us. Meet Mimecast. They're in the business of taking companies at risk of cyber attack and putting them at ease. Picture this. It's Monday morning. You're cruising through hundreds of unread emails. Your impulse to promptly click, download, or respond could be a prompt to launch a cyber attack. An email address is a direct digital path to the mind, the machine, and the data of every person in your organization. It needs better security. I know what you're thinking. I'm all set. I have Microsoft 365 protection, Dave. It might not be enough. That's where Mimecast comes in. They've developed a system that fortifies your email security and reduces costs, risks, and complexities, enabling you and your business to work protected. So before you click your next email, visit Mimecast.com to start your free 30-day trial. That's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast, where I join Jason and Brian on their show for a lively discussion of the latest news every week. Find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The CyberWire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Urban and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by our editorial staff. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Oh,